Hello, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to the afternoon session, which is on statistics. Uh, our first speaker is Dave Bly. Uh, and given that Dave Bly needs no introduction and would like some of his time for his talk, I'm going to keep this introduction short. He's going to talk about black box uh, uh, variational inference. Thanks, Yang Will. Um, I'm Dave Bly from Columbia University, and I'm going to talk about uh, black box variational inference. Thanks very much to the organizers for inviting me here to speak. Also, thanks for having the conference, and thanks for making probabilistic programming. Um, well, really, it's amazing. You know, it's a field started by grad students, which is an impressive, <laughs> incredible feat. I mean it. Um, and this is a, it's a special thing. So black box variational inference. I prepared too long a talk, so I don't want to keep rambling like I am now. So I want to start kind of like Zubin did, just to set the stage for why we care about probabilistic programming with a, the same punchline, but a different way of getting to the same punchline, or maybe the same way, um, which is that we have complicated data, and we want to make sense of complicated data. Okay, so especially these days, if you work in machine learning or data science or statistics, whatever you want to call it, then um, you know you sit around doing nothing and then data sets appear on your hard drive. So what does that mean? I want to dig into that sort of semi-vacuous statement. <clears throat> First of all, what does it mean for data to be complicated? Well, it can mean a lot of things. Traditionally, it might mean that data is large, like there's many, many data points, and also we measure many things about the data points. It might mean that data is unstructured. I have text documents that are not easily represented in a matrix, but rather are a collection of words that have syntax um, or some kind of other structured sequence or something like that. Um, and it can be multimodal and interconnected. There could be many different types in my data set, um, like images, text, people clicking on the images, the social network of the people clicking on the images, and so on. Right? So the, the data is complicated in all these ways, and this is different from the way your grandparents analyze data. My grandparents, they were a baker and a real estate agent, so they didn't analyze data, but your grandparents maybe did. So what does it mean to make sense of data? Well, that also can mean a few different things. Traditionally, it means make predictions about the future. I get a bunch of data. I think that the world is going to keep lumbering along the same way it has, and I want to predict what's going to happen next. Um, it might mean I want to identify interpretable patterns. Okay, so I get a bunch of data, like maybe Facebook, and I want to understand something about the community structure in Facebook, and I want to be able to interpret who are these different communities, how, what characterizes them. Um, perhaps most ambitiously, and Zubin alluded to this too, um, I want to do science. I want to take these big data sets that are complicated that I want to make sense of, and I want to confirm causal theories. I want to form new causal theories. I want to flesh out existing causal theories. I want to understand the world through these complicated data in a real way. And so probabilistic machine learning is about developing machine learning methods that connect our theories and assumptions about the world to the data that we observe in the world. And the idea in probabilistic machine learning is to provide a suite of tools that help us do this in a scalable way. And our goal, our goal as probabilistic machine learners, but also our goal as probabilistic programmingers, is to develop this methodology to make it expressive, scalable, and easy to develop. And what I mean by that, expressive means whatever assumptions I want to make, I'm, I'm, I see the Facebook uh, speaker here, so whatever assumptions I want to make about how communities form and how people communicate on Facebook, Whatever they might be, I'm a sociologist or I, or I study people and I understand all kinds of theories and assumptions about that, I want to be able to, to encode them in a, in a formal probability model. That's what I mean by expressive. Scalable, of course, means I want to be able to then calculate something about that model with my data at large scale. And easy to develop means I don't want to have to um, develop an inference algorithm for each new model that I develop. Rather, I want it to be easy to go from a model to an inference algorithm. I don't need to say that in this crowd. So just some examples. In, in my group, we worked a lot on um, the finding interpretable patterns in large, complicated data set. I'll go through these examples quickly um, so I can get to the stuff I want to talk about. These are things like finding communities in large networks, looking at finding topics automatically from large collections of text documents, analyzing large collections of people's genome sequences to understand their ancestral populations and how they mixed, looking at fMRI data and trying to understand how different parts of the brain light up and how that changes when you look at different pictures of things in the fMRI machine, um, 
analyze, this is an important problem, taxi trajectories in Portugal. Uh, and, but this is done with a probabilistic programming language. This is some of the work of Alp Kuchu Kelbier, who's here um, in Stan. Uh, look at declassified cables from the State Department to identify world events. Uh, this is cool. This is a discrete choice analysis of a big data set of people shopping at the supermarket. And this is some work we did with an economist where we learned that crackers and cheese go together. <laughs> and, um, and all of these examples are examples of building a probability model of a complicated data set and then looking at something about what we can infer through that model. And the idea with all of these is that we go through what I like to call the probabilistic pipeline, which says that we start with our knowledge and assumptions about the world and some question we want to ask about it. We turn that into a model that has hidden and observed quantities in it. We then square our data and the model to infer the hidden quantities given the data. And then we use the results of that inference um, in some kind of application. We form a prediction, or we explore and interpret the data, or we do causal inference. I like this picture because this separates these key activities of making assumptions and performing computation and then applying the results of the computation. And it makes it easy to collaborate with people on data science, statistics, machine learning problems because we can work with a domain expert on making assumptions and then they can go away and we can work on developing an algorithm that squares the data with the assumptions. And then we call them back and we can look at what the results say and if they make any sense neuroscientifically, for example. Now, the key algorithmic problem here is, of course, posterior inference, right? This is this problem where I take my model and my data and I want to infer the hidden variables, the unshaded nodes, from the data that I observe. Posterior inference answers the question, what does this model say about this data? And our goal in probabilistic machine learning, and especially in probabilistic programming, is to develop inference algorithms that are general and scalable. We want to be able to scale up to large data sets, but we also want to be able to easily handle many, many types of models. All right, so in probabilistic programming, you, we don't need this slide in this conference, but represents these models as programs, right? These models define generative processes of data that involve hidden elements interacting to produce the observed elements. Represent that as a program, and then the inference engine compiles, compiles in air quotes, the program into an inference executable, a, a program that takes data as input and spits out these inferences, spits out inferences about the latent variables. And so the kind of algorithms I want to talk about today are black box variational inference algorithms, which let us do, which enable us to use variational inference in probabilistic programming systems. Okay, and the two key ideas here are auto differentiation and stochastic optimization, which I'll get to where they fit in in a little bit. I just want to mention this. This probabilistic pipeline really is a loop. We like to call this boxes loop, where we build our model, infer something about the hidden variables, do something with them, but then check our model, see where it went right and wrong, and use what we learned in that check to revise it. So it's not a pipeline that ends here. It's a loop. And somehow probabilistic programming, if we can succeed, is about lubricating this so that we can go around and around many, many times easily. Right now, or uh, anyway, very recently, until probabilistic programming became more robust, um, things ended here because you spent so long deriving your, your bespoke inference algorithm that you got married to your model and you had to write a paper at this point. But what we want to do is be able to go around and around. Okay, so again, this mirrors Zubin's slides. Um, in a little bit more detail, we'll talk now a bit about variational inference and what black box variational inference is, and then I'll go into a little bit even more detail about black box variational inference. Try to organize this so you can fall asleep at any point and you won't, you won't be able to, you won't miss anything. Um, so what's probabilistic machine learning? Well, <clears throat> probabilistic model formally is a joint distribution of hidden variables Z and observed variables X, okay? So in this talk, Z is hidden and X is observed where all inference about the unknowns is done through the posterior, the conditional distribution of the hidden variables given the observations, P of Z given X. And for most models that you might care about, this is hard to calculate because of the denominator P of X, and so we appeal to approximate posterior inference, MCMC, variational inference, map estimation, whatever it might be. We appeal to it because we can't actually calculate this posterior through which we're inferring something that we can't observe in the world. So <clears throat> this picture is important. Variational inference is an approach to approximating the posterior distribution. And what variational inference does is 
tries to solve the inference problem through optimization. Okay, so contrast this with MCMC, where you solve the inference problem by trying to sample from the, from the distribution you can't calculate. Here we're going to solve the inference problem by doing an optimization. And the idea is this. So I'm going to, can you see this laser pointer? Yeah? Okay. So imagine every place on the slide, every point on the slide is a distribution over the hidden variables z. Okay? Every point on the slide. The idea behind variational inference, so here's our target, p of z given x. Okay? That's what we want. That's the posterior. The idea of variational inference is as follows. We're going to define a, a family of distributions over z, call it q, that's parameterized by nu. So every point in this uh, ellipse is a parameterization of q and corresponds to a distribution of z. We start out with some parameters nu, nu init, and we optimize following some path to nu star where our hope is that nu star is close to the exact posterior that we care about. <clears throat> Excuse me. That optimization, what, how do we define close? Well, there's a few ways to define it. We heard earlier from, uh, from uh, one of the pioneers of expectation propagation from Tom Minka, um, where, where it's defined one way. Here we're going to define it with KL between Q and P. So the KL divergence between a point in this family and the exact posterior that we care about, that defines the objective function that we use to optimize new. That defines closeness. Okay, so that, that's variational inference. That's all methods of variational inference. Set up a family of distributions, start out with some parameter, optimize to get that parameter close to the exact posterior that we care about, and then proceed like it's the Wild West and use new star as though it's the posterior. Use Q of Z with parameter new star as though it's the posterior and form posterior predictives and examine your latent variables, et cetera. Okay, that's variational inference. Okay, so here's an example. Alp made this picture of using variational inference to fit a mixture of Gaussians. And so, <clears throat> in short, we start out, this is the, we're, we're illustrating the induced posterior predictive that comes from the variational approximation. When the algorithm starts, we have a pretty bad posterior predictive. Here's our data. This is the data we observe, only we don't get to observe the colors. The data is just unclustered. It's, it's data that comes from a mixture model that's, that we don't get to observe which mixture component each data point is part of. And as variational inference proceeds, the posterior predictive gets better and better at capturing the distribution of the data. And here, this evidence lower bound, you heard a little bit about that earlier in one of the talks, is w this is essentially, think of this up to a constant as being that KL divergence between nu and, and P of Z given X. We're getting closer and closer to the exact posterior until we finally get as close as we're going to get. Okay, so this is, uh, this is variational inference in a nutshell. Now, <clears throat> Zubin, who I keep mentioning, told us that, that inference is time-consuming and error-prone. And this slide is evidence to both of those assertions. <laughs> this is the appendix. So I worked on probability models when I was in grad school, not that long ago, 1999. And, um, and I worked on developing the latent Dirichlet allocation model, which Dustin uh, talked about in his talk. And um, this is the appendix to the paper that uh, Mike Jordan and Andrew Ng and I wrote about LDA, um, where we derived the variational inference algorithm. Okay, this is the appendix. And this is just the first couple pages of the appendix. It goes on and on and on. It took us a long time to write this appendix, to derive this algorithm for just one model. And even worse, there's an error in this appendix. Okay? <laughs> so the goal of probabilistic programming and generic inference is to do away with this infinite number of appendices that we, we've had to write. And the idea behind black box variational inference, this is the dream of black box variational inference, is to be able to use variational inference with any model, to be able to do inference with very large data sets, and most importantly, to not have to do any mathematical work beyond specifying the model. I want to be able to just write down the LDA model the way Dustin did in his slide, which was the program of the LDA model, and not need to write an appendix about it. That's the idea behind black box variational inference. And this enables us to use variational inference in probabilistic programming languages. So this is just a partial list of probabilistic programming languages that implement black box variational inference, I think. Infer.net 
also implements variational inference. They mentioned that earlier, of course, uh, though it's, it's a different type of variational inference, but that should be on this list too. <clears throat> okay, so again, variational inference solves inference with optimization. And we wanna do this generically, where we don't have to do any mathematical work beyond specifying the model. So in a little bit more detail, um, the KL divergence that we wanna find, that we wanna optimize is intractable. We can't calculate it for the same reason we can't calculate the posterior. So what variational inference optimizes instead is called the evidence lower bound, or we call it the elbow. <clears throat> the evidence lower bound is a lower bound on the log probability of the observations, and maximizing the elbow is the same as minimizing the KL, okay? The difference between the elbow and the KL is precisely this term, which is constant with respect to the variational parameters. Here's the elbow, and you can see that this is one way of writing the elbow. Actually, Matt Hoffman has some nice papers where he shows all of these different ways of writing the elbow. This is one way. Um, the elbow has two terms. The first term is the expected complete log likelihood of the data and hidden variables. And just to be clear here, this expectation is with respect to the variational distribution Q, which is of course a function of the variational parameters. This whole expression is gonna be a function of the variational parameters nu. So the first term is the expected complete log likelihood. X is fixed, that's the data. Z is the random variable here. The expectation is over Z. Um, and that term, if you just think about that term by itself, it prefers Q to place its mass on the hidden variables, the configuration of the hidden variables Z, that give high probability to the data, all right? Log P of Z is, uh, and X is log P of Z plus log P of X given Z. And so up to that regularization, this is gonna want Q to place all its mass on the configuration of the hidden variables that explain the data, or more precisely, the map estimate of those hidden variables. <clears throat> but there's a second term in the elbow, which is the entropy of the variational distribution. Notice again, that also is a function of the variational parameters. And the entropy of the variational distribution um, is, as a term, is encouraging Q to be diffuse. All right, so these are at odds. Here I wanna place all my mass on one configuration of Z, so I want Q to be a delta at that configuration, the map estimate. But here I want Q to be diffuse. And so these push and pull on each other, and, and, and that's the objective function in variational inference. As a caveat, the elbow is not convex. So when you run the optimization procedure, you get to a local optimum. Okay, but it's machine learning, so we just don't worry about that. <laughs> now, the basic idea behind black box variational inference, there's, there's many types, but the basic idea in all these types <clears throat> is the following. Here's my objective function. So just to be clear, I've now fulfilled my promise of, of implementing this picture, right? I, I have a good objective function and I'm just now gonna optimize that objective function and then I'm gonna use the results as an approximate posterior. Okay, and the idea is as follows. First, I'm gonna try to write down the gradient of the elbow as an expectation with respect to Q, okay? Then I'm gonna take samples from Q in order to take a Monte Carlo estimate of that expectation. All right, I'm just gonna sample from Q and then use those samples to approximate that expectation, <coughs> excuse me, with a weighted sum of those samples. Finally, I'm gonna use that Monte Carlo estimate, which will be an unbiased estimate of the gradient of the elbow in a stochastic optimization to optimize new, the variational parameters. All right, so stochastic optimization, as probably many of you know, is about optimizing when in the face of noisy realizations of the gradient. And so we use the Monte Carlo estimate as a noisy gradient in a stochastic optimization. So that's the recipe for black box variational inference. But of course the key is to keep in mind the black box criteria. And what are those? One, we should be able to sample from Q. Okay, that has nothing to do with the model. If I have lots of different types of distributions that I can sample from, I can store that in a library and I can sample from Q. Two, we need to be able to evaluate Q and its log. All right, that's another part of the black box criteria. And three, we need to be able to evaluate log P of Z and X. Okay, we'll add another one later. But for now, we'll just evaluate log P of Z and X. And that is essentially the same as writing down the model. If you wrote down the model, then you can evaluate, well, then, often you can evaluate log P of Z and X. 
Okay, a probabilistic program can evaluate the log density of some configuration of the hidden variables and the data. And then there are two main ideas in black box inference, variational inference. One is the score gradient and the other is the reparameterization gradient. These are ways to construe the gradient of the elbow as an expectation with respect to Q. Okay, I, uh, I, I don't know what time this talk ends, but <laughs> what's that? 20 more minutes? Um, that's amazing. Oh, okay. <clears throat> okay. 20 minutes, we'll just start again. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so the first gradient is the score gradient. The first one I want to tell you about is the score gradient. And the idea is to use the score function, which is the gradient of log of Q, which I forgot that's another something else we need to be able to calculate. But again, that can be done about Q, so we can store that in a library. The gradient of log of Q with respect to the variational parameters and, the, and what I'm calling the instantaneous elbow. The, for a particular realization of the hidden variables, the log joint minus log Q, okay? The instantaneous elbow, a function of Z and nu. So the expectation of this is the gradient of the elbow, okay? And this has many names. Um, I'm calling it the score gradient here. But notice it satisfies the black box criteria in that no model specific analysis is needed. You just need to be able to calculate log P of X and Z. Everything else is about Q. And I could take Monte Carlo estimates of this by sampling from Q and approximating it with a sum. All right, and so this is basic black box variational inference. I start out, I'll, I, I, I won't belabor this, but I start out with some data and a model. I initialize my variational parameters randomly. I set my step sizes appropriately, that's for the stochastic optimization. And then I take a bunch of samples from my current realization of the variational parameters, Z, and I use those samples to calculate a noisy score gradient with that expression I just showed you. Okay, so this is an unbiased estimate of the gradient of the elbow. I update the variational parameters with my step size and I continue. Okay, so this is a valid stochastic optimization algorithm of the elbow. Um, uh, yeah, basic black box variational inference. Okay, so <clears throat> sadly it doesn't work that well. You need to do some things to get it to work better. In particular, you need to control the variance of the gradient. All right, so I mentioned that the gradient's unbiased, but it has a variance and one of the um, uh, you know, something you want something to one concern in stochastic optimization is the variance of the gradient. If you if you have a high variance gradient and you get unlucky and you're far away from the from the true gradient, then you could take a step in a very bad direction and it's hard to recover. And so there are all kinds of tricks, Rao Black realization, control variance, important sampling, all in the literature for reducing the gradient of this reducing the variance of the score gradient. Another issue, as probably many of you know if you've encountered deep learning, is that um, the step sizes, one needs to take care in setting the step sizes. The classic Robbins-Monroe is one way to do it, but there are lots of new adaptive ways to set the step size, and those also improve black box variational inference. And then finally, if you have massive data, you can do data subsampling. If, you're, if your log joint decouples by data points, you can do data subsampling to add further randomness to your gradient and require less computation. <clears throat> okay, so as an example, let's look at deep exponential families. This is the kind of hard model that we wanted to do inference on when we thought about black box variational inference. And the idea behind a deep exponential family, I won't go into too much detail, is that I have a cascade of latent variables for each data point that bottom out in the observations. And the generative process is to first choose the first set of latent variables from some exponential family, <clears throat> choose the second from an exponential family whose parameter is conditioned on the first, and so on, all the way down to the bottom, where you finally then choose the observations conditioned on the last layer of latent variables. All right, so this generalizes ideas like the classical sigmoid belief net and the, and the deep latent variable Gaussian, or and some of the um, Gaussian-based deep models. And, um, but you can imagine putting Bernoulli, Ber Bernoulli variables here with Z or gamma variables here with Z for different types of latent representations of your data. Now, this is a requirement of every computer science talk to have a table like this where you do the best. 
And <laughs> this table tells you exactly that. However, the point of me showing this table here is that we made this table. And the idea with this table is as follows. Just ignore these two lines. Down here, these are all deep exponential families with different numbers of layers and different parameterizations of these hidden layers, um, of these hidden variables at each data point. And here we have gammas. Here we have sigmoids. These are like sigmoid beliefs. Here we have Poissons. Um, we have different numbers of layers and different uh, uh, numbers and different cardinalities for those layers. And the point is, each of these is an appendix, right? This is one NIPS paper in 1994. This would be another one in 1995, and this would be another one in 1996. But we just had one paper about all of these. So maybe that's a step backward. But <laughs> the point is that black box variational inference is kind of a turnkey solution to doing variational inference. And we could use the same algorithm to fit all of these models. We also changed the prior, by the way, on the parameters to those latent variables. They're, per they're perplexing. So this is a language modeling task. Um, and these numbers are perplexity. There's something like held out log likelihood, exponentiated per word average held out log likelihood. OK, so that's the score gradient. That's one way to do black box variational inference. The second way is with the reparameterization gradient. Now, the way the reparameterization gradient works is this. First, we express our variational distribution with a transformation. Okay, so what that means is that I draw some simple latent variable epsilon from a distribution, S of epsilon. It's got fixed parameters, it's a fixed distribution. Then I set my variable Z equal to some transformation of epsilon. That depends on the variational parameters nu. All right, and when you do that, if you have a good transformation, then Z comes from Q, okay? So if I can express my variational distribution as a transformation, a T and a distribution of epsilon that satisfies this little three lines, <clears throat> and if both log P of X and Z and log Q of Z are differentiable with respect to Z, that's a new requirement, then I can use the reparameterization gradient. And the reparameterization gradient looks like this. I take the gradient of the transformation with respect to the variational parameters, and I multiply it by the gradient of the instantaneous elbow, here's the instantaneous elbow again, with respect to z. Okay, so this requires not only that I can evaluate log p of x and z, but also that I can take its gradient with respect to z, those hidden variables. That's the reparameterization gradient. What's great is that in the modern world, we can use auto differentiation to take these gradients. So happily, this still does satisfy the black box criterion criteria because if I write down the model in TensorFlow, I'm pointing to Dustin, then, um, then auto differentiation takes care of those gradients for which in the past we would have to write an appendix. I wonder if my students can take gradients anymore. I'm not kidding. <clears throat> and they're amazingly smart, but we just don't need to take gradients because of auto differentiation. I know they can take them, to be clear. We can also use and reuse different transformations. So these, these transformations can help us get different cues um, uh, and reuse them across different variational inference problems. Okay, I won't belabor this. It's the same algorithm, only I replaced the, the score gradient with the reparameterization gradient. Okay, this is how, for example, we learn that crackers and cheese go together. This is a complicated model that would have been difficult to do inference in. And this also is, was the key to putting variational inference in STAN with some other ideas as well, um, but it's the reparameterization gradient. Okay, so those are the two main ideas, I think, in black box variational inference, the score gradient and the reparameterization gradient. Let's compare them. The score gradient works for discrete and continuous models. It works for a large class of variational approximations, but the variance is large. You have to control the variance, and if you care about being black box, you have to control the, the variance in a black box way. The reparameterization gradient requires differentiable models, which means that discrete variables are hard. You can't use them. Um, it requires that you can write your variational approximation down in a way that is transformable, but the variance is better behaved, and that helps you with your optimization. Okay, so um, in Alp's paper, for example, you can see that as the number that that the the variances operate as promised. Um, and one way I like to think about these two different gradients is which classes of models can they be used with, okay? And so, 
for models that can use the score gradient are evaluable models, models where you can calculate log P of X and Z, right? And that's this set here. Just trust me, that's this set. Um, models that can use the reparameterization gradient are differentiable models, models that I can differentiate with respect to Z, and that is a subset of the evaluable models, okay? But again, the reparameterization gradient has better variance properties. Okay, so probabilistic machine learning is about building machine learning methods that connect domain knowledge to data. And our goal is to make it expressive, scalable, and easy to develop. Again, posterior inference is the key problem. And black box variational inference gives us general and scalable approaches to doing posterior inference. Finally, I want to end the talk with just to ask you to stare at this picture. This picture, I think, helps us situate the flurry of research on variational inference. Like right now during this talk, there are like nine more archive papers that involve variational inference. What are they about? <clears throat> How do you think about them? Should you read them? So first, there is the class of models, okay? So P of Z given X. What, under what kinds of models can I do variational inference? So Zubin and Matt Beal have a paper from 2001 about conditionally conjugate models, models where I can calculate all kinds of conditional distributions, and that's one class of models. You can think about models that are not conditionally conjugate, but where I can differentiate the log likelihood. That's like reparameterization gradient. That's a, that's a larger class. You can think about those where you, can, you can't differentiate the log likelihood, but you can evaluate it. That's the score gradient class of valuable models. And you can go beyond that, and uh, Dustin and Rajesh have worked on implicit models where you can't even calculate the log likelihood, but you can sample from the model, right? So in physics and, and ecology and epidemiology, for example, there are many models like this where I can't even write down or evaluate the log likelihood, but I can sample from the, from the, from the model. And in their paper, you can even do variational inference in that class. Right? We can ask the question, what about the family of variational approximations? We can think about things like structured variational inference um, or variational models, amortized inference like is used in the variational autoencoder, and recent methods on sequential Monte Carlo and variational inference are all about expanding and adjusting the shape of this class of models. And you can imagine if you can expand it in good ways, then you can hope that you can get closer to the exact posterior. What about the distance function? I asserted that we use KLQP, but you can think about other distance functions as well. And then finally, you can think about the algorithm itself, the optimization. I can use the entire field of optimization to help me now do posterior inference. <clears throat> All right, there's lots of work to do in variational inference. I'm quite sure I'm out of time. Um, and here are some references from our group of of, of some recent work in variational inference. Thanks very much. You good? Yeah. So Dave was actually perfectly on time and we have time for a few questions. Um, if you'd like, you can come up. There's a microphone on the left and the right. Uh, if not, we'll repeat the question for uh, the recording. Yeah? Um, the question is, can I motivate how the reparameterization gradient uses the variance? Reduces. It reduces, sorry. What did I say? Uses? Yeah, I don't know. Thanks. <laughs> um, I, I, I can't, it's, it is written down in a paper that's not by me, and I can't remember which paper. Does somebody know which paper proves that? For Gaussians, it is, yeah. But in which paper is that? I think it's in an. 70s paper. That's right. So Dustin said some 70s paper. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I mean, Lauren, Lauren Hall has a paper that thesis, What's that? Yarin, Yarin Gall has some. Ah, uh, okay. It's not always true, says Riff, and some 70s paper says Dustin, and. Um, I mean, generically, it's what you use gradient information you didn't have. Yeah, I was going to say that. So one one motivation is that you're using more information. So you would expect that you're going to, that there's going to be some benefit. The expectation, the, the, the estimator is already unbiased. So it's not like you're going to reduce bias with that information. So the last thing left to, to benefit from is the variance, but that is hand wavy even by my own standards. <laughs> yeah. Are there other questions? Yeah.
Oh, yeah. Th thanks for asking that question, because I meant to mention when I talked about Box's Loop, which has a model evaluation, that ALP has a poster here about model evaluation being an important aspect of this pipeline. And um, I mean, this conference is about what we need in order to get there. So we need to be thinking about how to evaluate models so that we can, we can revise models in an intelligent way. And um, so, you know, to read about model evaluation, like classical model evaluation, I like work by George Box and Andrew Gelman and Don Rubin um, on posterior predictive checks. And um, it's not perfect, but it's, it's one way to think about model evaluation. And the basic idea is simple. It's saying that the model, a, a, a Bayesian model is a conduit to a posterior predictive distribution. And what you want out of your Bayesian model is that the posterior predictive distribution um, captures the true distribution of the data. And so, and they take it further, it doesn't really capture the true distribution of the data, it captures the true distribution of the data in the ways that are important to you. And so posterior predictive checks are about designing tail probability type calculations that are around is the posterior predictive close to the true distribution of the data. And, and then if it's not in the ways that you care about, then think about the model and how to adjust the model to, to fix it. So that's, you know, the, um, the papers are Rubin 1984, uh, Bayesianly justifiable something, 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 and Gelman, Mang, and Stern about posterior predictive checks from 1996. Those are great papers. All right, let's thank our speaker again. Thanks.